I am Jim Collison, and live from our virtual studios around the world, at least today in Omaha, Nebraska, this is Gallup's Builder Talent Tuesday, recorded on July 28th, 2020. Builder Talent Tuesday is a Gallup webcast series that dives deep into the builder profile talents in the community around it. We interview Gallup experts and independent B10 coaches to help maximize the talent of individuals, teams, and organizations around the world. If you're listening live, love to have you join us in our chat room. There's a link actually right above me there. If you want to click on that, it'll take you to YouTube. Sign into the chat room. You can put your questions in there live, and we will discuss them as well. If you have questions after the fact, you can always send us an email, coaching at gallup.com. Todd Johnson is our host today, Todd's Gallup's channel leader for entrepreneurship and job creation. And Todd, it's always great to have you back. Welcome back yeah. to Building Talent Tuesday. Time flies. It seems like uh, there are times during this pandemic that it seems like time stands still. And then there are times that uh, it flies by. And I have no scientific explanation for that. Um, I've This has been fascinating as we've relaunched, but every single edition we've had, Jim, I think I've been more excited about our guests. And that's not to diminish previous guests and not to put pressure on future guests. But uh, <laughs> this is a real exciting one. I'm I'm not going to read Dell's bio. I mean, how many times have we been out giving talks where somebody stands up and reads your bio? I'm not going to do that. I've I've known this gentleman for many many years. Is it ten or more? At least at least that. At it, least. Could, it could even be before I came to the Fed. And I've been at the Fed for ten years this year. We've. Uh, and we've been really good friends for at least half that time. That's uh, now we've been friends since the beginning and have shared many panels and many podiums around uh, around the state, around the Midwest. Uh, Dell is uh, a senior executive of the Federal Reserve Kansas City branch based here in Omaha. We're blessed to have him in Omaha. He is an accomplished uh, author on the topic of which we're going to discuss today. He's a proficient uh, speaker and uh, evangelist on the importance of ecosystems and talents, but I thought I'd share a kind of a goofy story. When, when I was first coming into my professional career, a mentor once told me, Dal, I don't know if you know this, but a mentor said, never share the stage with someone who's smarter, <laughs> better looking and funnier. And as I was reflecting, apparently your mentor never shared that advice. <laughs> okay. I'm sorry. That's a joke. We tend to open these up, levity, levity. But in all seriousness, I can I can joke with you about that because none of it's true. Uh, I've been amazed at your <clears throat> ability to transform a room uh, with your vision, with your mission. And uh, we're going to kind of this is your show. But I've got a few questions that I want to just kind of get us going with. And just for the audience, we didn't we didn't share these in advance, so these are not prompted or or these were just reflecting on your expertise. You know, I thought you could first start us off. And it's a term that I actually think is really misunderstood. So when we're talking entrepreneurship, I, I cringe when people say pivot, because in my vernacular, pivot is something that squirts the uh, 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 irrigation fields, at least in Nebraska. That's what a pivot is. But another term that's always baffled me because people use it in so many different uh, contexts is ecosystem. Dell, what what is an ecosystem? Um, it was a short way to think about it, it, it and it's, it's just logical. It's, it's the context and the networks uh, in which entrepreneurs start and grow businesses. Okay. I mean, you, you can simplify it really is that, um, you know, uh, there's different features and, you know, that you, you add in that, like we usually look at um, at least in you know my work, the six elements of it, which are, and your your coaches will appreciate this, like the things an entrepreneur has, like a tool that they acquire, utilize, and then the what's happening in their environment and, and how they interact with each other. So, like you have your human capital, like you you focus on talent at Gallup, right? Yeah, yeah. You know BP10, you know focuses on human capital. Then you have your social capital, which is your networks, you know your connections, the the, the those kind of resources driven through relationships. Like it could be someone picking up the phone and calling you, you as a business owner and saying, Hey, I got an opportunity for you. You want to check it out? Um, somebody could put you on to different opportunities and um, that you may have not considered before in your business, things like that. Then of course you have your financial capital, you know, the, 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 
lifeblood of business. Those are kind of the things that an entrepreneur has like a possession of, for, for yeah. example. You know, then you have your environmental factors, which are kind of your culture, which is very understated. Um, hmm. And, and culture is not just, you know, kind of like your local culture that, you know, supports on that celebrates and supports entrepreneurship, sets social expectations and things about like that. It could also be bigger, your orient your your orientation towards risk. Like you go through BP10 risk orientation, like the general orientation towards risk towards a, 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 a within a community. Example, let's uh, you know, we've heard stories in rural communities of the anti-risk conservative nature. And it's not just rural, but rural just comes to top of mind where in some communities entrepreneurs are are actually stifled because of the fear of failure and what the 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 culture and the community will say if they fail and therefore they don't start right so the issues of culture what how it contributes or detracts from you know the necessary elements of risk taking of of being celebrated as an entrepreneur social expectations of entrepreneurship then you have your infrastructure which is just logical which you know consists of like what we were talking about before and we'll get into later which is you know access to broadband you know the the local technology but also your physical infrastructure like you know the the environmental factors like streetscapes accessible retail at affordable prices based upon the environment and then you of course have your policy you know what is your local community doing um to you know create effective policies that support entrepreneurship are they reducing unnecessary red tape are they um developing funding mechanisms to support the ecosystem etc all those three things so you have those three you know factors that entrepreneurship has you know human capital social capital financial capital all which can be developed and then you have the environmental factors that kind of are what they operate in or they they start their firms you know and grow their firms in and so those are kind of the elements that we say of the ecosystem but it's it's important this is what makes it different right it's not just that their elements exist is that they all interact together in dense and intelligent ways to support the entrepreneur. That's what makes ecosystem building unique to any of its predecessor forms of economic development, industrial attraction, entrepreneurial development in the 80s, cluster-based building is that the entrepreneur is front and center and the ecosystem is designed to support that individual to start and grow the firms in the best way possible. And so that's, that's kind of what I've been working on the past 10 years. Yeah. Okay, so in those 10 years, I'm put you on the spot here, but <clears throat> who or where in the country is just rocking it? Who is best practice? And I know you're not going to say Silicon Prairie because or, or Silicon Valley because, you know, I've been there many times and the place is full of everybody from the world trying to replicate that ecosystem, which is just a fallacy and not going to work. But so you're not allowed to say that one, but who, what are some, pick rural, pick Midwestern, pick whatever you want. Who's rocking it and why and how they do it? <laughs> How's that? Yeah. Yeah. So um, I know Don Mackey uh, from Center for Rural Entrepreneurship. Well, it's not that anymore. Each entrepreneurship to accelerators down with Network Kansas, but he's from Nebraska. Most of a lot of people here know him. Um, you know, he'll tell you Ord, Nebraska kind of their deep dive case study, you know, rural Nebraska, you know, organized around supporting entrepreneurship and the culture that supports it, you know, as a small rural community is an example um, of that. You got the work they're doing in Network Kansas with the e-communities, which is the subject of my dissertation. You know, there's now up to like, I believe 66 e-communities across the state of Kansas, um, the only state that actually has a statewide, you know, economic development model that focuses on ecosystem building run by Eric Peterson, um, and Steve Ratley, you know, my friends down there. Um, then you, you got get starting to get into some more specific, you know, initiatives uh, from different areas of the communities. You know, you have, you know, Cold Fever Miami, you know, focuses on African uh, American and Latina, Latino or, you know, oriented tech ecosystems and the development mm -hmm. of that. So you're starting to see these. But now we would be remiss not to point to Silicon Valley, not because it's the standard that we should strive for but because it is an example of how an organic ecosystem developed and it has its flaws, you know, a lot of racism, sexism out there. And, and um, now you can't even live there by many accounts for the average person. But when you look at it, the reason people, you know, kind of look at Silicon Valley um, and kind of say, this is, this is something we strive to be is because 
they figured out a few things. One, they figured out that, you know, driving tech, bit led innovation and entrepreneurship as well as bring, building an ecosystem around it. So if you, you take those six elements that I, I, I yeah. put there, right, yeah. and you, you superimpose that over Silicon Valley, you can kind of see how it works at one of the largest possible scales where you have very fluid and interactive tr education, training, cultural orientation, infrastructure development, so, you know, social capital, social network, all of these things are what have, you know, it evolved into almost organic, well, very much organically with the exception of a few people driving it at an early stage to say, we're now producing this. You know, what we say in ecosystem building is every community has to kind of orient themselves to what they want to be and not try to replicate Silicon Valley, but there are lessons from Silicon Valley that are useful at the largest scale when we say we want we want to build an ecosystem. Interesting. Um, yeah, it, it again frustrates me that so many communities try to cookie cutter stamp that exact infrastructure or culture on their community. And you've you and I've talked about that over the years. I mean, if you want if you want a lot of racism, then yeah, cookie cutter. Yeah, it. Right. I mean, if you want a lot of sexism, cookie cutter it. But I right. think we can do better. That's that's leading me into my next question. You think uh, we didn't prepare any of this, but you've seen the data. We shared some of our recent data. We know that the talent to build, you know, knows no zip code and is is beautifully agnostic as it relates to you know, gender and diversity and inclusion and all the important topics of the day. In your expert opinion, why do we have, I'll just call it a, a, a problem, but we could probably say crisis in, you know, people of color starting businesses? What What's going on out there and how do we fix it? You know, Todd, I forgot, I forgot to say that these views do not necessarily represent the okay. views of the Federal Reserve Bank of Kansas City nor the Federal Reserve Bank. Of Kansas. Whenever we're out giving talks, you start with that. But yeah, yeah. yeah. So I, I guess after that, those last couple of statements, I probably should have put that out there. Jim first. can cut it and put that up front. <laughs> Either it. way, it, is, it got said. This so is Bill Gaines at all. So, so, but, but it's interesting. So I just recently wrote an article on Medium, and I wish I would have, you know, gotten that early research you and Dr. Badal did earlier on, um, because I knew it was in the BP10 where you all kind of showed through the research that, you know, kind of this talent cuts. I mean, like all the, everything that you sent me was within the margin of error. You, everything is pretty much equal. Like the talent is universal. Right. And so if the entrepreneurial talent is universal and it's going to break by, I mean, and obviously we can quibble on how that's defined and what we're looking at when we say entrepreneur, but using your methodology, it's universal. So it, Black woman, white male, South African, Asian, it's all within the, the margin of error that the talent is going to break across the population fairly consistently, right? Yep. Well, I wrote an article called um, recently, I think a couple of weeks ago on Medium that, that said how not building an inclusive ecosystem leads to economic inefficiency. And there's a logic to it, right? So, it, you know, and I went back wonky stuff that probably most of your people won't care about. But, you know, the Nobel Prize winning economist um, Gary Becker wrote way back in the 1950s and 60s about the taste for discrimination. And what he was showing is that, you know, at the time, white people would be either willing to pay more to get a product from a white person for where equally or cheaper, per, you know, product from a black than an equally cheaper product from a black person or in the labor market would pay a black person less to do the same job and the same productivity, right? Mm -hmm. So, and he won ultimately won a Nobel prize for kind of showing that this his, historical view of economics is simple inefficiency of the marketplace is creating inefficiency was not accurate. There's actual inefficiency created by this. So when you look at an ecosystem that's not inclusive, meaning that we're not really doing our best possible to get the resources to entrepreneurs based upon their talent level and not any other associated characteristics like race, gender, et cetera, you create inefficiency. Well, why is that? Because ultimately what ends up happening is you end up allocating more resources to get the same results. If you're just, let, let's take, let, let's say discrimination with, with um, you know, whites versus blacks okay. and BP10, let's take the BP10 framework and you, you have these two Uber entrepreneurs, one is white and one is black. Now, let's say that the resources are allocated towards the second tier of the white 
you know, entrepreneur where he doesn't have that same, you know, Uber entrepreneurship. He's just solid, but he's average. But yet him and the and the entrepreneur that has the Uber talent, the African-American Uber talent, both get the same level of resources. Well, logically, that's not going to be the most efficient way to allocate it because he's going to produce less than this person. In a logical world, we're going to allocate the resources the most to those that are going to produce the most from an economic standpoint. Mm. Now, if you, if you end up replicating this across the entire scale, and now you start seeing how the resources are, are allocated so inefficiently because we continue to, racism and discrimination gives the resources to the people that have lesser talent on average than the group that's discriminated against. Mm -hmm. And if the BP-10 model is correct, logically, we want to apply the most the resources to the ones that are going to produce the most return on investment exactly. and discrimination inhibits that. So you have an inefficient entrepreneurship ecosystem, which leads to an inefficient economy. And that's what racism and discrimination does. Wow. And so our objective, and that's why I asked you to send me the, the research again, because I may retroactively go back and put that in that article, because I was I was thinking of, you know, our conversations on that and, and with Dr. Badal when I was writing the article and I just couldn't find it in my stuff. I'm like, this is where we put this in there. And we turn around and say, well, look at the research on BP10 shows that you know, this is this is universally consistent across geography, et cetera, blah, 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 everything we just said. Therefore, if both people have the same amount of talent, but we're not seeing the same level of productivity in each person, everything else has to be environmental or contextual or personal right. choice. Right. It, the, the research I remember from years ago, and it's searing, I, I still... Uh, and I'll share it. the the unemployment rate. So economic vitality and opportunity. The unemployment in Ferguson, you know, was fifty eight percent, and we wonder why there was civil unrest. You know, you look around our volatile, fragile communities, and you know, some think putting in a Walmart fixes everything, but in <laughs> fact, that might wipe out uh, nothing against Walmart. And I guess I'll do my Gallup disclaimer too, because I think they're a big client of ours, but. Um, <clears throat> that's not economic development in a sustainable, uh, in a sustainable way. Well, let's take, take your same concept and apply it at scale, you know, outside of the civil, you know, the civil, you know, social injustices that we're seeing that are prompting the riots, you know, I made a point, you know, and I think maybe when we were just chatting the other day, I said, you know, look at Occupy Wall Street, like what you're seeing now is not just a, just you know, issues of social justice where we're seeing these American rights, because I know you've got a, a global audience. Actually, it's a global, you're, you're global protest. It, you know, there's a combination of, of economic factors going back to Occupy Wall Street combined with the social factors of, you know, state violence on African-Americans that are driving, fueling a lot of these protests. And you're, you're exactly right. We've seen this progressive failure of our economy to adequately address the concerns of the most vulnerable populations, which is increasing, like the wealth gap is increasing. And even though prior to COVID, we saw a significant decline in the unemployment rate, a lot of those weren't living wage jobs. People were working multiple jobs. Like, and, and this creates the fuel for social unrest because when you have a strong economy that's working really relatively effectively for the most people that it possibly can, there's, usually little incentive outside of, you know, pure social justice issues for people to, 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 to riot. Mm -hmm. And this is, this is why we treat we, America to, to our positives or negatives, whichever way you want to classify, try to export democracy and capitalism as a way in a lot of countries, as a way to mobilize uh, uh, early stage mitigate social unrest in some of these yeah. you know, communities that we were engaging. Didn't work. I read today, some are saying now the recovery is going to be a K. I don't know if you've heard or seen that. You know, we hear a lot about the V or the U or the swoosh or the hockey stick or I've heard it's K. We're the wealthiest privileged are, are ex, you know, exponentially benefiting. And then those of, in many cases of, of color and of, you know, economic challenge are going to hit the deck faster, harder. So that becomes the K. I think that's something we have to figure out. Because uh, well, we, frankly. again, and you know, this is totally my opinion, we have a broken form of capitalism. Yep. Our, our, our form of capitalism is, is broken. It's not driven by 
broad-based innovation and entrepreneurship is, is driven by, you know, corporate consolidation and control. And when you have corporate consolidation and control, the winners are those that have shares in those corporations. Yep. And the losers are those that that either for lack of knowledge or lack of opportunity have access into uh, owning and controlling those shares. So it's just logic. So if uh, let's use the banking system as an example. Mm -hmm. You know, when we, I, I use black banks because that's the number that's relatively on top of my mind. There are 180 black banks coming out of um, 50 years after the emancipation. There's now 21, maybe less, right? And I'm using them as an example of this hyper consolidation in the banking industry. So you've had this massive consolidation in the banking industry to where maybe I think it's five to 10 banks yeah. own like 90% of all you know the banking assets in the space, something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Now, so you've basically created you know, this hyper you know, concentration of banking. So as that industry grows and they control that into a large chunk of that system, the winners become the shareholders. Mm -hmm. And so then you start looking at, okay, well then how does, how does wealth break down? Who is owning these things? And by and large, it's not, you know, historically low income whites that have, you know, immobility over their multi-generational financial immobility. It's usually not your Latinos, your blacks, your natives, et cetera. And so as this industry consolidates and continues to grow to scale and almost becomes, remember from the Great Recession, too big to fail, yep. the winners of that are those that by and large have large percentages of control in that stock. And the losers are those that don't have access to that same stock. So yep. now you have this huge and in, in increasing wealth gap. I mean, and I'm not faulting Jeff, Jeff Bezos, like his, because uh, I probably added a billion dollars worth of his net worth during COVID too, through all the shopping my wife has done at Amazon yeah, right. <laughs> during the period. So he has a valuable product, but that's kind of the way that if we want to look at how that works, you have those that are consumers and those that own the results of the consumption are the ones that create and get more wealth. Well, how do you fix that, Todd? More entrepreneurship. Yeah, I've argued for the longest, you know, because what, what you've had is this rise in this pursuit of socialism. And I've argued that one, that's a non-start in, in, for the broader U.S. economy at scale. It's not that we can't centralize nationally certain industries that make sense or certain functions that make sense. That's always wor worth a conversation. Like our police department is centralized in our cities, our fire departments by and large. But let's let's put those unique exceptions to the side. I've argued that the best way to decentralize wealth is to increase entrepreneurship for everyone. So even if we kept this, if we we had the same amount of corporate wealth holdings that we have today, and kept that the same, but we were able to adequately create inclusive ecosystems where communities of all different types and individuals of all different types were able to own, create and own the productions of their own hands through the wealth creation process of entrepreneurship, you decentralize you know, the wealth consolidation and you empower communities to be more democratic and do the things that they yeah. want. And thus comes stability and thus ultimately democracy and, and well-being, all those linked together. I've, I've heard, not necessarily on the race topic, but one of the challenges to entrepreneurship in this country over the last 10 years is the big five, you know, eBay, Facebook, Amazon, Microsoft, you know, the big five are buying up all the entrepreneurial technologies, yeah. A, because they have the money, and B, because they don't want something to come up and compete. And so they're actually, you know, the maybe the exit or the founders who are getting wealthy in that process are excited, but it's not really good for the overall ecosystem to lose consolidation of the small entrepreneurial, you know, energy. Yeah, so the, and and there's, there's research that, that shows that, Todd. So, um, so we, we do something at the Fed called Jackson Hole, and this is where our bank president, one of the best leaders I've ever had, Esther George, one of the 12 central bank, you know, Federal Reserve leaders in our system. She invites central bankers from all across the world. Um, and I think this is to Jackson Hole in, in I believe, Montana uh, once a year. And they discuss major monetary wow. policy issues. Right. Wyoming. I'm sorry. Sorry, Montana. <laughs> You're talking about Montana earlier. Got parents out there, man. That's my country. Yeah. So, yeah, Wyoming, Jackson Hole, Wyoming. So one of the things that they they came out of in this, all these thought leaders of national monetary policy, bi global business dynamis dynamism, and the, which is the the net rate that that um, entrepreneurs start and grow firms. So, so positive, we wanna see a surplus, we wanna see growth in that. 
but it's on the decline has been one of the major challenges in the global economy, right? Now, a lot of the research shows why, because as you grow bigger firms to scale, it what happens is exactly what you said. So now a Microsoft or a Google, et cetera, they are actually buying companies to destroy that company because they don't want it to be, right. you know, a, a competitor, like you said, or it stifles innovation through or absorbs the innovation all within one major firm versus decentralizing the, the, the wealth production. So when I say the problem with that we face is not a problem with capitalism, as some would suggest, especially those that are more, you know, coming from a, from a more centralized e economic lens like socialism or something similar, mm -hmm. it's to me, it's not fundamentally a problem with capitalism, it's a problem with broken capitalism. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because if our capitalism is not entrepreneurial, then it actually, creates the consolidation and the wealth gap that everybody's complaining about. And that's what we've seen a lot, in large part since the 1970s through what was known as shareholder primacy, mm -hmm. which means that, you know, the first thing I was taught, Todd, when I, in my MBA, first MBA finance class, when our professor asked us what, why corporations exist, everybody was giving their answers because we didn't know anything. And he said, no, you're all wrong. Corporations exist to maximize shareholder value. This is called shareholder primacy coming out of the 70s. Now, I want you to look at a few things, and it's not all related to this. So if you go back and you put charts together and you show a trend line, put a chart over the increase in the wealth gap, put a chart over the rise in mass incarceration, and what you will see is these things almost yeah, track right. each other perfectly. Sure. Right. And there's a couple others that you can put on there that are all tracking that. So all of these things are interrelated with each other. And how we do economic development is also how we do democracy. And it's also how we treat people fairly. Mm -hmm. And these are the conversations we're not really having. Well, not to give a, a plug, but I will. As hopefully you've seen or people know, you know, Gallup after George Floyd and the the uprising, if you will, of, of concern, we've opened a center on black voices. We're going to just for 100 years, have you seen some of this? We're going to track uh, 40 million African-American voices in the country on their well-being and what's going on and hopes and dreams. And it was on CNBC this morning. You'll, you'll start to see it now that we've talked about it. But we hope it's an important metric you know, George Gallup, all the way back to the beginning, if democracy is about the will of the people, we should know what, his will, what, what their will is. Well, we've never really done a serious job about tracking the black voices and their will. And so that was launched, I want to say, a week or two ago, but it's going to be a big deal. Um, you'll start seeing important data. So taking a, a slight departure, I wouldn't say pivot, um, what... How are things going in North Omaha, which is, for those viewers that don't know, one of our fragile communities? You know, what what do entrepreneurs need? How do they find customers? I'm going to hammer questions at you. What's the role of corporate, uh, of the corporate community, if, if there is one? And um, overall, how's it going? Yeah, it's so... You know, like like many, you know, urban black communities, the challenges are remarkably consistent because, you know, I go all across the nation and, and chat urban, rural, whatever in our urban environment. You know, you 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 trend to see and this is universal. It just it's, it's like Malcolm X said, you know, uh, what does it say? When, when white people sneeze, black people catch a cold. Hmm. Essentially, what Malcolm was saying was that the challenges that face the average, you know, white American become exacerbated in many cases when faced a vulnerable population. We can use black, Latino, whatever, right? Yeah. So so the, the the deficit like we just talked about, just to bring it back and connect it to dots. So when we talk about an economic development challenge is a challenge with both democracy and e equality, right? That's why economic development is so important. Yeah. Because, because that's how you just, cities come together and states come together to decide how resources are going to be allocated to create productivity and who's going to get the benefit thereof. So when we talk about that at, at, at the nation and this hyper consolidation of corporations and the Im impact that that has, now start breaking that down at, at the smaller level to the state and the city level, and then start breaking it down by targeted people groups, right? So when I say that there's a problem because we haven't focused on ecosystem building and creating a more, more egalitarian society through entrepreneurship, 
we can superimpose that over my community in North Omaha, which then is it's even exacerbated. So if there's a challenge with ecosystem building and effectively supporting entrepreneurs in the average white community, yeah, right. it's going to be exacerbated. Now, immigrants are unique because they do trend towards starting entrepreneurship at a higher rate. But when we talk about the diverse spectrum of, of entrepreneurship, which we, we would classify as kind of let's go through all the NAICS codes from, you know, service based businesses to tech oriented businesses from um, solopreneurs and gig economy workers to high growth gazelle unicorn businesses. If BP10 is correct, so I'm going to put a lot of pressure on you. You already know. If, it. <laughs> if BP10 is correct, then we should be seeing the same amount of gazelles and unicorns and in, in large scales and main street etc in north omaha coming out of north omaha not necessarily serving north omaha but coming out of north omaha as we would see in a silicon valley yep right in, in theory in, in a perfect world utopia entrepreneurial utopia right but when we start seeing the dimensions break down and we, we start seeing the lack of ecosystem development and the lack of resources applied to that relationships connectivity, and then you layer over discrimination, then we know that the, the, the biggest challenge that we have to face is how do we create an entrepreneurial culture that drives wealth in our majority black communities and our majority communities of color. So then we look at North Omaha and so you ask, you know, well, what do North, North Omaha entrepreneurs need? We need a broad, robust, entrepreneurial ecosystem that supports the human social and financial capital creates a better culture of entrepreneurship has stronger infrastructure and better policy hmm. some of some of that will overlap with other needs with across the city for entrepreneurs and the state and some of it will be have to be designed specifically for the unique needs of the north or south omaha customer yeah. and in the these are why things like i think bp10 are so useful because it, what it does is at least gives you a beginning benchmark of how to get people to think about their talent that they have for entrepreneurship versus just being abstract. And we can say, okay, you're strong here, but maybe you need support here. Or you're, you're a potential really superstar. How do we support that? And right now that's not in the system by and large. And needs to be in the last show we had Sangeet on talking about the power of team. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's one thing to understand thyself, but how powerful is it to understand who you need around you, you know, who's going to round you off or, or, you know, focus you because it's not natural to who you are. Maybe 10, eight years ago, we did the study where we took the adult version, which you took back in the day, ESF, and we gave it to uh, 3000 high school students. Uh, across Omaha, Creighton Prep, West Side, Central, Omaha North, OPS, you know, a couple Millard schools, and all the Av Scholar kids. And I guess we're being recorded, but, and I'm not sure if I'm allowed to say this, pound for pound, we had more entrepreneurial energy in the Avenue Scholars, which is a free introduced lunch mentoring program we have that cuts across a number of different schools. But um, I thought that was really searing. Uh, it wasn't the, you know, affluent suburban West Omaha high school per se. It was the Av Scholar students who, but to your point, with in in absence of the other elements of your ecosystem, you know, we're not maybe not going to see the builder trend pop up. I, I give you an example before we get to Jim. So yeah, I, so awesome. so I didn't have ESPN because, like I was telling you before the call, I cut the cord. Yeah. You know, and went, went straight digital. But okay. now now Michael Jordan's documentary is on Netflix. So yeah. the documentary everybody was talking about, about their final championship year. And so we would classify Michael Jordan as probably the uber entrepreneur, like not as an entrepreneur. I'm using him as a, his skill as a metaphor. Like yeah. if we took Aunt Jordan made it, and he was an entrepreneur on BP10, he'd be the one with everything, whatever the high yeah. color is. You got right? it. Yep. Now, now when you look at his life and they do a little bit about his life, what would, would Michael Jordan be as, as great as he was in, in basketball if he didn't have access to courts, coaching, a basketball, motivated family that was, you know, pushing him to, to, to be competitive and fight. So you look at the context, like talent alone is not enough. Yep. 
you know, you need all the things that go around it. And Michael Jordan is a great metaphor for that because you take him away from Dean Smith at North Carolina. You take away his brother that used to bully him on the basketball court and be competitive. You take away his even has ability to go and play the sport in and of itself. Yep. And, and now you begin to see when you use that as a metaphor, why so many communities of color are not producing the same level of entrepreneurial output. We don't have the courts. We don't have the coaches. We don't have the bully brothers, all of these different things. And these are the things that we need to wrap around our entrepreneurs. I love that analogy. And as you know, a lot of people are talking about it, which is maybe where it starts, but, but a whole lot of us are pushing to see if, I think there's a very big proposal under development for the ecosystem of North Omaha and, um, Others on this call are working on their, you know, community initiatives. So great analogy. Jim, do you have a question for? Yeah, I have a couple. Let's, while we're talking about North O, let's go to that. Uh, Jeff asks, how many of those businesses in North Oma have taken BP10 and are they getting coaching around talents? This kind of speaks to the question, Todd or Dell. Do we, do we have any idea on numbers there? I think Todd has done a lot of work around that, Todd. We've had different events. Uh, your point about, the assessment versus the coaching, there hasn't been enough, mm. just point blank. Um, you know, we all know that the assessment without the coaching is uh, kind of goes nowhere. Um, in Nebraska, we say just because you weigh a cow doesn't make it fatter. <laughs> and taking an assessment without somebody to coach you through and develop it, it's uh, not where it should be, Jeff. But at least we know that maybe that's part of the problem. Yeah, I think this this we haven't talked about this, but J Justin says how important you feel environmental sustainability is or will become as a factor in delivering successful entrepreneurship. I, I, well, I think it's de definitely interrelated. Like you, you can't, and and this is where the beauty of entrepreneurship is: is we need to apply our entrepreneurs to the concept of environmental sustainability. But again, there's a lot of collusion and and. Um, marketplace steering in that space as well. I, I think when you look at it, like I'm just going to look at it from my daughter's environmental justice, you know, major. When you look at it and you look at how the issues of environments and sustainability negative wise disproportionately affects black and brown people and low income people building, like I've heard terrible stories of, of communities built on landfills, under power lines, um, there's broader base work in that space. I, I think what you're going to see, and this is me putting on my Gallup futuristic strengths hat, you know, as a top two strength, I think you're going to start seeing more of a convergence between these things where people are going to start looking at how the dots connect versus separate. And you're going to see how entrepreneurship in the ecosystem is connected to the environmental environmentalism and sustainability of that particular community and the social justice side of how these things work and a lot of other factors. Because America, as we've evolved as an economy, we became a specialized economy, which led to productivity. And as a result, you had a lot of pieces that didn't see the whole, but now with globalism and hyperconnectivity, now we're bringing everything back together into this interconnected weave and we need new tools and methodologies to be able to connect those dots. And environmental justice and sustainability is one of those dots. Uh, is there, uh, Dell? Is there a space, uh, or you just for entrepreneurs in this area of just environmentalism, as far as getting it right and and helping businesses adapt and change and mold and do whatever they need to do to to begin to move in that direction? Well, I know that there's more energy in it, um, but we again, I, I hate to sound like a dead horse. This is why we need better ecosystem building. So if you if you look at ecosystem building as the hardware and the particular expressions of that as the software, your software is only going to function as like if try, try running Windows 10 on a computer with only two gigs of RAM. Yeah. Like we would, if this one hour webinar would take three hours of us trying to get through <laughs> it because the failures of technology. Right. Like, and so we, we as a community need to do a better job of developing this orientation towards how do we build an ecosystem around these entrepreneurs and the things that they're dealing with in their everyday lives. And if we can do that, then we can, there's definitely going to be a space where we can pull together better, you know, environmental oriented entrepreneurs, because that is a thing. People are talking about it now. They think about it now. They're trying to apply it in their workforce. I know um, I was talking to my friend, Rob Troublecock from um, Bank of the West. One of their biggest, big initiatives is green energy, primarily out West. 
Um, so, so even big industries are thinking about this. So we just need to figure out how to get our entrepreneurs to tackle it. Because when entrepreneurs tackle something, it creates a win-win solution most often because they're solving the problem while generating economic productivity, which creates a win-win for everybody. Todd, do you want to add anything to that? No, I, how can I add to that? <laughs> I can only ruin that. Um, Dell, do you think, um, has COVID, the COVID-19 changed anything for the better or for the worse when we think about the entre entrepreneurial space? Well, I think it's done a few things. Now, whether it's it's going to last remains to be seen. One, unlike uh, the prior recessions, is it's recentered. It's recentered the, the necessity of small business owners. Like, if you remember early on, most of the conversation outside of the public, obvious public health side, was around the impact that the, the the pandemic is having on small business owners. This was not the case in the the Great Recession wow. coming out of two thousand and eight. Nope. Um, small business owners have been front and center. It's forced many communities to look at how they support these businesses and, and the infrastructure that supports them. And hopefully that that is something that will continue after that. The secondary is I think that it's forced a lot of businesses to look internally and look at how their infrastructure is 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 developed. Like, you know, if a lot of people weren't getting couldn't get a PPP loan because they couldn't pull their stuff together. They didn't have their infrastructure place, black and brown businesses, other businesses as well. So uh, a lot of people couldn't the, where Todd doesn't like pivot because they didn't have they weren't tech enabled or have the tech and basic tech. I'm not in, I'm not talking about being a coder or producing a new tech firm. Oh, and you're talking about. I'm yeah. talking about simply lear learning how to use Uber Eats as a restaurant, <laughs> you know, like things like this. Like and I think that's put a shock to the system of the, the nation and a lot of entrepreneurs to start orienting themselves to the entrepreneurship of the future. The question is, is are we as the folks that support that field, are we we doing the things necessary to make sure that they have a smooth runway into this new orientation? Or are we going to allow kind of this gravity to kind of pull back or put a lot of roadblocks in front of it, like often happens when a recovery happens and no you know, everybody says, okay, let's just get back to business as usual. During the pre-show, you and I talked a little bit about infrastructure yeah, and the necessity of it. And of course, we have seen the, the infrastructure, the internet infrastructure be stress tested during this time. How important is it? There's been a lot of activism and I think there's been some, some fairly positive activism by the white community to, 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 you know, to see some of these things move forward. How important would it be for that community to focus on putting pressure, downward pressure on some of our infrastructure organizations to behind the scenes improve the infrastructure, stuff we don't typically think of, but <clears throat> maybe provide better internet, so to speak, in some yeah. of these communities. Yeah, and that's fundamental. So like 75% of all the work I did the first five years I was at the Fed was in rural communities. And so, you know, when you look at the development and the infrastructure of broadband and the ability to have that, it's it's a paramount importance both in urban and rural. Like, uh, but I want to make a point. So, like, I'm trying to lead, uh, you know, hopefully get a new initiative in, internal to the bank, focusing on tech and innovation to create racial wealth equity. We've been having these conversations, but I the argument I made that is the digital divide is not just a consumption issue. So the ability to access effective broadband and technology, it's also a production issue. It's who's producing the firms that are creating the new technology or the supply chain of that technology. So when you don't have the basic infrastructure of, of technology, broadband and infrastructure in place, it's very hard for any community, urban or rural, to develop, one, do general economic development in the first place, but two, begin to produce the kind of firms that are, that are going to be strong moving forward, whether it's a tech firm specifically or a tech enabled firm, it's just going to be hard to build them. And as a result, you're going to see those communities that don't have that access begin to continually lag. So I was at a Brookings Thought Leader event a couple of weeks ago, just prior to COVID out in D.C. And they were pointing out the fact that when you look at the, the, the dispersion of innovation, it's really consolidated into like four areas of the nation. Um, and like these major areas, like you may suspect high density population areas, high technology, high levels of innovation, and the rest of the, the rest of the nation was lagging behind in terms of economic productivity. So they, their whole big thing and what we were talking about was how do you create more innovation hubs across the region, across the nation, so that we can have more balanced economic growth. We'll take the same concept and apply it to, let's say, Nebraska, where you have some 
some rural communities that have, have really strong broadband, but those that don't, you're going to continue to lose your youth. You're going to continue to have challenges of development. You're going to con continue to struggle to figure out ways that you can organize your economy so that you can continue to grow and hopefully retain and attract new people. The same is for your urban area. We, to me, I mean, this is just my, again, my personal opinion. If I was going to centralize one aspect that the government was going to tackle and say this is going to be centralized, it would be universal broadband for everybody mm -hmm. as, 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 a, as a state right. You know, and I don't I, and I don't necessarily like to use the term right. I think we use that too arbitrarily. But as a state mandate, as a long run guide to having a healthy Nebraska or whatever state that you're in would be universal access to a minimum level of broadband. So every student and every adult could be on the information highway. And if we do this, then we can expect a, a corresponding return in economic productivity on the long run, because you can't leave people out of the digital age and expect your economy to remain strong and equal. Yep. A whole bunch of our CARES money, as we'd also talked about, was for broadband development. And we've been talking about it for years in Nebraska, but I was on with one of the leaders at UNL saying, well, it's, you know, everybody's going to go home and Zoom the rest of their education. Or and it's like, no, they're not because their only access was the Starbucks and it's closed. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's a, a, maybe a shame on me for assuming that living in a highly intensive broadband, you know, digital environment, but doesn't exist out there. We've been the first EAS program we, we were interviewing and talking about broadband. I think as we see a very natural departure from heavily vertical urban communities, which have proven to be unsafe in, in a COVID environment. You know, rural America is licking its chops, but to your point, they've got to get the digital infrastructure or they can't compete mm -hmm. for population. And uh, it's almost like water and electricity anymore, right? I mean, it's it's got to be at that level. Yeah. We'll, we'll do one more question and, uh, and I'll throw it Dell. I'll start with you on this one. So Jennifer asked what innovations, and we talked about infrastructure, so we'll leave that part out, but what other innovations and technology have you seen that best really support these, these ecosystems? Well, I, I, th I think now, so, so I would say there's general and specific technology. Like we've seen a few emergent technologies to actually support what we call formal ecosystem building. Um, uh, David Ponraj, I, I can't remember the name of his, his application, developed a really cool app um, that basically allows an entrepreneur to or, or a institution like a university to stand up, you know, their application and it identifies all the resources within within that given ecosystem for this for the entrepreneur. Um, you know, I, I would not say it's an emergent technology, but it's a strong utilization of technology as U.S. source link. Um, and I know we're trying to get a version of that here in Nebraska, but there are a ton of communities across the nation now. And it's basically a, a centralized portal database that houses, you know, the resources for entrepreneurs, but then also puts a navigator and help uh, support, uh, you know, individual on the ground to help do the human elements of kind of connecting the dots of that. Um, and then you have, those are kind of more specific things. I think there's a lot more that we could do as the field grows to kind of assess it and say, okay, if, if we're trying to build kind of these robust network connected, you know, relationships across these different platforms and culturally specific relevant or geographic relevant, what can we design? Um, I think we're going to continue to see more of that, that coming out, but then your general, I mean, just the stuff we're using now, like the, the acceleration of the use of, 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 sites like steam yard which, yard which we're on now of zoom of all these things that that are allowing people one both the, the technological platform but you to the comfortability with connecting you know virtually and digitally on a repeated fashion like are going to be huge for ecosystem building because you're dealing with a broad range of stakeholders across the local geography state geography and being able to build bring them together so i i think you're we have the technology and for the basic and the foundation of it, there's a lot of technology that we still continue to need to build like any field to get it done. I think this interview is a great example of how that if the infrastructure is not in place, just imagine if we had had really bad broadband for you and your picture was, was pixelated. <laughs> And exactly. And, and distracting and or we couldn't hear you or you can only hear half of what you were saying or just the equipment that you have. You have a really good microphone. We can hear you clearly. You can hear us. There's no distractions. The light is good. I mean, 
all those things are kind of a, a great example of an ecosystem that we that has been put together to make this work. We have viewers from around the world viewing this on their broadband connections as well, and are able to get the, we the, the, they're not seeing it any. I mean, they're not seeing the technology anymore. They're just getting the information, mm -hmm. and I think that's just a perfect example of when the ecosystem, when the infrastructure starts to break down that way, we're hampered. Justin was saying in the chat room. You know, in the early days and my very first day of coming home, uh, my I got locked out and I couldn't get my like my password wasn't working and I couldn't get on anything. And like I spent six hours between here and had to go in and get it fixed. <laughs> Lost productivity right on basic services as like getting signed in. And so I think this is a great example of had we not had that infrastructure not been in place. We couldn't do this. Ten years ago, we couldn't have done this. We can do it today. Right. So, Todd, anything else? Anything no, final? Remember plugging their computer into the thing at the payphone in the airport. <laughs> remember? Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I sure can. Dell's probably too young to remember that, but Jim and I do. No, I, I'd like to thank Dell for your, uh, obviously, your expertise and your time, <clears throat> um, your friendship, and your mission and passion around this. I let's almost do this publicly, but let's, let's commit to creating some best practices in Nebraska that can be showcased. Um, I agree. I hear about, or there need things going in broken bow. You know, there are pockets of rural, but, but let's see if we can't get a fragile community, you know, stood up and uh, you've rekindled my uh, energy around that. <clears throat> and, uh, you, you know, Todd, I, for, I forgot to say that, you know, we got a lot of stuff coming out, but the, the most, the one I think may be most interesting, especially to your American coaches is um, we got a guy coming out called um, the guide to the recovery for small business owners of color. Hopefully we can get that out. It's in the editor editing process now. And um, it, it puts a broad range of potential solutions to support small business owners of color. And then they can go and look at a lot of our other stuff that we have on ecosystem building across various communities, urban rule, whatever. Sure. Um, they, they could just go to KansasCityFed.org. Um, yeah, KansasCityFed.org. Go to the community section and you'll be good. Awesome. Dell, thank you. Jim, thank you. Um, Amanda Carrion has her meetup for coaches tomorrow on Zoom. Amanda at TimberlineCoaching.com for those coaches that might not be signed up. And uh, the uh, the BP10 movement is alive and well and more important than ever. Uh, Dell, thanks for making it real in, uh, in your expertise and your spheres of influence. And uh, I'll thank you in person here hopefully soon. Not sure when that'll be, but I'm sure we'll Zoom here shortly. Del, if anybody wants to find you in the public space on the internet, uh, so to speak, where would they find you at or what's the best place to track you down? Yeah, so it's just Del Gines on Twitter, although somebody did catfish me. So if you got to see a guy that looks like me that works for an oil company, uh -oh. that is, that's not me. Uh -oh. And then, then on then on Twitter, it's I am Del Gines because if you go to Del Gines, somebody stole my name a while back and they sell like North Korean candy under my domain name. So it's I am Del Gines on Twitter. Del Gines, not the oil salesman the real on LinkedIn, the real Del Gines. You'll see from right. the KC Fed. G I N E. G I N E S, yeah. That's right. Well, with that, we'll remind everyone to take full advantages of all the resources we have available. Really, if you want to check them out, and, and this page probably doesn't use it enough, but head out to gallup.com slash builder and all the resources are there, including the 10 talent themes we did a couple years ago uh, as we dive into those and these themes. We've actually been redoing season two for. Uh, Builder Talent Tuesday and, and have been changing those as we go. So if you have not subscribed to the podcast channel, you probably want to do that now. Head out to any podcast app and search Gallup Webcast and you'll see all the podcasts that are available from Gallup there. A uh, couple reminders, if you want to join us live, and why wouldn't you? A great conversation today. You kind of had an influence over. Uh, join us on the our Eventbrite page. Go to gallup.eventbrite.com. Uh, sign up and follow and uh, follow us there. You'll get a notification whenever we go live. If you are, if you have any questions and you're listening to the recorded version and Todd, tens of thousands, maybe even a hundred thousand will listen to this interview. So, and you have an email, if you have a question, send us an email, coaching at gallup.com. And then of course, join us in our Facebook group. That's just facebook.com slash group slash gallup BP 10. That is the special BP 10 group that is out there. We'd love to have you involved in that as well. If you enjoyed this today, if you found it helpful, share it. Uh, the link, you can grab the YouTube video for it now. 
share that with others. We'd like to have you do that as well. Thanks for coming out today. With that, we'll say goodbye, everybody.